many Orthodox will claim that Pope Gregory the Great, who you just mentioned, who we say is a very firm proponent of uh, the papacy, they will say that, in fact, he denied the papacy. Um, He himself denied the fact that anybody, including the Pope, could have a universal jurisdiction. So therefore, by your own claims, you're proving with your own Pope that is not true and that the Eastern Orthodox probably are correct. Yeah, Can- yeah. This this one is a fascinating one because it just comes up so often. He's actually one of its star witnesses because he himself notes that, yes, the Bishop of Rome does have universal um, oversight of all of the bishops in the world, including Constantinople, Alexandria, and Antioch. You said that Pope Gregory actually affirmed papal supremacy and universal jurisdiction, correct? That's correct. Not only did he affirm it, he also exercised it. Like he's talked about it. Like we have quotes of Pope Gregory affirming the papacy, universal jurisdiction, Roman primacy, and all of this. So you have a quote by chance by Pope Gregory the Great um, in your book and this chapter. Uh, that maybe talks about it. We could just, I would like to hear it. Here's one. And this is one of many, which is why, again, I even note Protestant um, scholars who recognize that Gregory the Great affirms papal supremacy. So even even Protestants admit it. Um, But here's just one of many. And it is exceedingly doubtful whether he says such things to us sincerely, or in fact, because he is being attacked by his fellow bishops for, as to his saying that he is subject to the apostolic see, if any fault is found in bishops, I know not what bishop is not subject to it. But when no fault requires it to be otherwise, all according to the principle of humility are equal. So what Gregory is saying is this, look, when there's no problem and no controversy going on in the church all bishops are equal but when there is a controversy and bishops disagree with each other on a matter of theology now the supremacy of rome kicks in and rome gets to sub, uh gets to say all of you guys are subject to me and so i'm going to settle the issue everyone else is subject to my decision so he's saying in matters of controversy every bishop Every bishop is subject to Rome, but in times of peace and no controversy, they're all equal because there, there's no controversy to settle. Yeah. And like you said, that's one of many quotes. And I think there's even stronger quotes than that. You know, I don't understand, except that it seems a little bit dishonest to me that they're going to pick this out. And I can understand not understanding the historical context that it specifically has to do with John the Faster, and he's not making a general statement on that. I can understand people not being aware of the general context. You do have the issue where Gregory the Great is reprimanding um, John the Faster of the Patriarch of Constantinople for his use of the title ecumenical patriarch. Ecumenical can mean multiple things. It could mean universal, um, or it could just refer to the um, Roman Empire. You know, there, there's some roots with the the term there. And of course, the Bishop of Constantinople represents the city of Constantinople, which was the uh, new Rome, which is new Rome, where if you recall in church history, the Roman Empire was split into two halves, um, with one capital being in old Rome, the city of Rome, uh, and the new capital being in new Rome, Constantinople. And so since that is where the Eastern Emperor was, and of course you have the Western Empire fall in, in church history, um, the Bishop of Rome as the Patriarch of New Rome, uh, the empire there in the East, was considered the um, ecumenical patriarch. Because again, he is the most second in um, command. Uh, Second, uh, I I should say, um, almost the most prominent bishop in all of the ecumenical empire. Second only to old Rome. Um, Now, whenever he used this term, all he was saying is that he has this prominence as the patriarch of New Rome. He's not saying that somehow he is over every other bishop 
in every other diocese. He's not saying he's this universal shepherd and these other bishops aren't really shepherds. But that's how Gregory the Great understood the Patriarch of Constantinople when he was using the title Ecumenical Patriarch. He was understanding him to say that he is somehow this super bishop over all of these other bishops, this universal bishop, and that these other bishops outside of Constantinople aren't really bishops. You know, so it was kind of a straw man, right? This is not what the Patriarch of Constantinople meant by the title. Gregory misunderstood it. Uh, but Gregory writes against this title. So John the Faster, just to be clear, John the Faster was not using it in the universal sense, but Pope right. Gregory thought he was, and he thought it almost like he, it sounded like he was making himself the Pope. And so he was basically saying that no bishop outside of the Pope of Rome could ever claim universal jurisdiction, right? Exactly. <laughs> That's 100% it. And so there was a confusion in terminology on how the term ecumenical is being used are we referring to just the roman empire especially in the east or are we referring to somehow a headship over the entire universal church Be because of the way because of the equivocation of the term ecumenical so there was a misunderstanding on part of gregory so he blasts the patriarch of constantinople for <laughs> using that title and says it's antichrist to use that title right um now, this is where some Orthodox misunderstand because they then think, oh, you see, even Gregory the Great, the Pope of Rome, is against this notion that the Pope is a universal bishop. There's an equivocation going on here. No, he was condemning a straw man understanding of the term ecumenical. Um, now, we can see that especially in Gregory the Great because he himself knows that the Bishop of Rome has authority over all of the other bishops, including the Patriarch of Constantinople, Alexandria, and Antioch. So he himself recognizes that. So the proper notion of universal bishop, the proper concept of the headship over the universal churches, Gregory affirms. He's just rejecting this straw man understanding of the term ecumenical patriarch, which would somehow mean that all the other bishops aren't actually bishops. You know, the Pope recognizes other bishops are really bishops. It's not like the Pope is the only bishop in the world and these other guys are just filling his spot for him. No, the Pope recognizes they're real authentic bishops with real authority in their own territory. So there was a misunderstanding in language here. And so rather than Gregory somehow, uh, you know, fighting against the universal supremacy of the Bishop of Rome, he's actually one of its star witnesses because he himself notes that, yes, the Bishop of Rome does have universal um, oversight of all of the bishops in the world, including Constantinople, Alexandria, and Antioch. No, but what I can't understand always is that there's so many pro quotes by, the, I mean, even by Protestants who say the papacy was started with Pope Gregory the Great because he's so such a firm proponent of it. They even see how he speaks, you know, for it. And so I don't understand how they could take this one, but ignore all the rest of the things he said. You know, and this, I want to point out that this isn't an us against them. You know, it's not, you know, we're right, you're wrong. We're good, you're bad. We have authority, you have none. Like, it's not what this is about. You know, it really is the way that Jesus established the church when he uniquely gave Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven and gave him, you know, authority to bind and loose and such. He made him the royal steward and an apostol, uh, uh, one that has succession. So this is what we're talking about in Matthew 16, 18, and 19. All the apostles received authority, Matthew 18, 15 through 18, but Peter uniquely received the keys of the kingdom from Jesus by him. So it gives him a special primacy of authority having those keys the way he did. So I just want to point that out that this is biblical, you know, and it really has been this way since the beginning. Yeah, and, and it's important to note that because some people are going to come back and say, well, hey, aren't the keys of the kingdom also given to all of the apostles in Matthew 18? Well, we actually have an ecumenical council that says, yes, the keys of the kingdom are given to all of the apostles in Matthew 18. However, they're initially and principally given to the um, 
to Peter in Matthew 16. So he's the one given the keys primarily, and then in a secondary way or a mediatory way, the keys of the kingdom are also given to the rest of the apostles. And then that maps on to the successors of the apostles. The Pope as successor of Peter is the one who principally holds the keys of the kingdom and the exercise of authority in the church. Whereas the other successors of the apostles, they also have the keys of the kingdom. They also have governance and teaching authority in the church, but in a mediatory way, whereas the Pope has it principally. Right. Jesus could have just given the keys to all the apostles altogether, but he singles Peter out time and time again and gives him a special authority. John 21, the good shepherd, uh, the gospel of Luke, you know, you bring back your brothers, but I'm going to strengthen you alone, even though Satan wants to sift all of you as we, you know, the keys of the kingdom he gives to Peter uniquely. And this has been seen back to the earliest days of Christianity, this unique authority given to Peter. Um, so, yeah, no, those are all really, really good points, uh, Michael. Um, so... Thank you.